I guess I was fairly apprehensive the whole time that I was flying in combat. And, and I guess there's good reason to feel that way. I'm there to cause a lot of damage and a lot of harm, and therefore they would like to damage me. And I was 25 years old at that time. Top Gun was really a thrill. I must have done well in actual combat because at the time I was just a lieutenant junior grade, which is a, a first lieutenant in the Air Force. And so I may have been the very first lieutenant junior grade to go through Top Gun. That was the dream of a lifetime come true. I had wanted to be an aeronautical engineer and a test pilot just like my dad from the time I was 10 years old. STS-27 was my, was my third launch and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. Well, I will never forget, we maneuvered the arm and Mike Mullane was my arm operator, so he moved the arm over there and we brought up the television image of the right wing and I looked at what I was seeing and I said to myself, we are gonna die. To be an airline pilot, there was mandatory age 60 retirement. I was a NASA astronaut until I was 50 years old. And so I looked at the situation and I had known a number of Southwest Airline pilots. And they were just like me. They were flying because they loved to fly. Well, there's a lot of piloting that goes into it, a tremendous amount of piloting that goes into it, because you're going to wind up passing other airplanes. You're, you're going to get in a duel with another airplane that's fairly closely matched. So there's a ton of satisfaction from, from doing that. And, hey, let's just talk about the racing itself. It's fun to fly low but it's dangerous. I wanted to be around airplanes, so I enlisted before the draft could get me. This is before the war started, before we got into it, and uh, went to Columbus, and uh, they sent me to Keesler Field, and uh, I, was there. I wanted aerial photography is what I wanted. Never thought about my artwork, but I, they did find out I did sign work, and Keesler Field said, well, there were new uh, photo photography story, uh, schools opening up all over the country. So they named off different cities and a bunch of the guys were lined up and ready to go to school. So they said Patterson Field and I said, let's take that one, that's near home. So three of us, one fell from Elkhart, Indiana, another one from Detroit. They joined me and we came to Patterson Field. Keesler Field never sent any paperwork whatsoever on us. So the commanding officer at the Patterson Field said, well, I can't have you just laying around. So he assigned three to the sixth air depot and six or three to the 10th air depot, which was my group. And uh, worked here at Patterson for about a year, getting ready to go overseas and 
Um, finally took off for overseas on the fastest ship in the world, which was the America, renamed the West Point when the Army took it over, and uh, took us 11 days to get over to Liverpool. And the Germans knew we were coming, and they had a nice air raid force. So we got on the train, and they pulled into a tunnel so they couldn't strafe our tr uh, train. I don't know what happened at the air raid, but they pulled back out, and we went into a small village into a park and we were green at this stuff and it was in a park with a creek ran around or little water uh, ran around the park and I was on guard one night and I heard this water rippling and I couldn't see a thing and of course my mind was could it be Germans coming across <laughs> I mean we were really green so it, we worked at Burtonwood. Have you ever heard of Burtonwood? That's, I would guess, prob probably the largest airfield over in England. And uh, we were very early in the war. There weren't many there, and they had jeeps. All, you could look all around the field, and there were jeeps parked to be assigned to groups. So we traveled back and forth from uh, Point and Park it was, to Burtonwood by truck. And we saw all these Jeeps around, nobody using them. The keys were in them. So several of the guys, my included, took one of the Jeeps. And we wrote our trip tickets and we'd drive out and the trucks are going back and forth empty. <laughs> and everybody was driving personal vehicles. and. Uh, Eventually, we pulled up to the guardhouse, leaving Burtonwood, and he looked at the list. He says, yeah, you got to give your jeep there. That's being assigned to a unit. <laughs> so we all got out and got on the truck as the truck came in. But uh, then we, from there, we moved to Watersham. This is all with the 10th Air Depot group. And uh, I've got to take a picture of our tree that's out in front here. And, uh, we went to Watersham, that was near Ipswich, and we spent about a year there. Then, uh, I'm hesitating about one story. We had a colonel that had a dog, and I had to paint stripes. I was in charge of the paint shop, and I had to paint stripes on the dogs. He had a, a canvas thing that went over his back and over his shoulder. And if the dog was good, he got a rating. And it was always published with the GIs on the bulletin board when they got a rating. Every month, if the dog was a bad dog, he got broken. So I had to keep changing the stripes every month. And that, that colonel was one that nobody liked him. He was a West Point graduate, but he was a little bit weird. And uh, we went to, he took us, he took us to Zeals. It was a grass field. Our planes couldn't ran, land on the grass field very well. We had B-17s, so well, we can't land on the grass. So in several months that we were there, not one plane ever came into our field. We couldn't service them or do anything if they can't come in. So Colonel Green, you probably never heard him, but he was a classmate of Eisenhower's. He had started our group, and he found out we were in zeal, so he pulled some strings, and we were not supposed to be there in the first place. And we moved in the dark after night, and. Uh, we were moved back to Wallisham again, and the colonel liked the paneling that was in the office, and he liked the flagpole that was out in front. It was all British stuff. So he had the guys take up the flagpole, take the paneling off the office, he's gonna take it with him. Well, the guys did what he told. So they took all this stuff, and we left, and. I got a letter that 
I don't, I don't think I brought that with me. He was reprimanded for stealing this stuff, and it was his doing. And he was given a choice of either retire or be dishonorably discharged. And he had to sign the letter, and I have the letter, and he had to sign it that he had read it. And he retired. But that was a, he was a full colonel. <laughs> but he, he pulled some really weird stuff, and I, it, uh, but uh, that was that story. But when did you know you were an artist? Did it begin when you were a little boy? Five years old. I used to draw cowboys and Indians on my brother, on my sister's books. In the where there was any empty space, I would draw cowboys and Indians on there when I was five years old, and they never stopped me. <laughs> they encouraged me, and. Uh, in uh, elementary school, I did a painting of Old Ironsides, the old sail ship, and the superintendent of the school saw it, and he took it. I thought he was taking it down to the high school to display it. I never saw it again. <laughs> but uh, that's all I I spent more time in the art class when I got into high school. I would skip English, I'd skip gym, I'd skip math, all those different classes. I'd stay in the art class in class and do artwork, and the art teacher let me do it. And it came to graduation, I didn't have enough credits for graduation. So the art teacher and this principal of the schools, they got together and decided I spent enough time in art class to get my credits, and they graduated me. And I was already two years behind in my class because I, I just didn't, I didn't study. I was in art class all the time. Mm -hmm. so and how did, how did you get started painting nose art on airplanes? Well, at Keesler, well, yeah, at Keesler Field, they found out I did sign work. Then they found out I did artwork. That was after I left Keesler Field. They didn't have a runway at Keesler Field when I was there. Um, that runway was covered with tin cans. We put tin cans on a big log, and the guy would smash them, and we'd throw them out in the field, and that's where the runway was. I often wondered what happened when all those cans rusted underneath the concrete. And, I mean, it was bound to deteriorate. But uh, they, it didn't start at Keesler Field, it started after I got overseas that they found out I did artwork. And so then the, the planes had come in for modifications. They had heard about me, and so they'd come to me and say they wanted a painting on their plane. And they usually had a picture of some movie star that they wanted. So I'd go out and do it after I got through with my work. And it worked till dark. And one plane I did, um, oh, that was uh, Texas Longhorn. No, it wasn't Texas Longhorn. Um, Virgin on the Verge. I got the painting of the girl done, but it didn't have the lettering on. So I figured, well, I'll go out tomorrow morning and put the lettering on. Went out the next morning and the plane was gone. Went back to its own base. Well, somebody else at their base did the lettering, so they took care of it. I saw it afterward, and they took care of the lettering. But uh, planes had come in like that, and they had heard from other crews that had been there that I did nose art. So they'd come to me, and one crew came to me, and they said, I, I thought it was Texas Longhorn. Well, it was Longhorn. and. I was corrected on that. It wasn't Texas. I think the pilot was probably a Texan, so it was Texas Longhorn. And I, I did some Longhorns on that plane, and uh, that was then uh, 12 of us were sent to uh, Thurali, the 306 bomb group, and I have their patch here. And uh, I, uh, we were there about three months because they were running out of parts. I mean, the planes were coming back, shot up, and they didn't have parts to replace them. So they were 
tearing B-17s apart for just some little thing to keep other ones flying. Well, we had all the parts. So we furnished the parts for them and they were happy to see us. And this uh, Texas Longhorn was sitting out of our side of our hangar and they said, they came to us and said, we needed a carburetor. Otherwise they're gonna start tearing our plane apart. And our officer that was in charge of us, he says, well, we gotta get it all cataloged and on the shelves. We didn't even have shelves yet. We had to build shelves, we had a carpenter with us and had to build shelves and get the stuff up there. And that's where I learned how to run a forklift. And uh, I, just because it was a fun thing to do. And uh, our sergeant told this crew, come back after dark, you'll have your carburetor. So they come back after dark and we, the sergeant, he knew where the car, what carton or uh, what was the big crates. He knew which crate had what in it and he got the carburetor out and gave it to them and they went out in the dark with a flashlight and they were working on the plane. And uh, they asked me to do this Texas the Longhorn on it. So I went out, put the Longhorn on the other side of the plane while they were walking up, working on the other side. And uh, so it just got out that I did nose art. Then I wanted more artwork. So I, I was painting two girls on the officer's dining room. It was, a, it was like a theater, a stage here and everything, and the, the sides here. I was putting two girls on the thing, and uh, I thought, oh, how am I gonna get a transfer? If no, Normally, you'd have to go to your first sergeant, and if he approved of it, then he'd go to your commanding officer, and if he approved it, then you might get it. I wasn't gonna get it. But right around the corner from where I was painting the girls on the officer's dining room was the commanding officer of the field, Colonel Sloan. And there's a funny story mixed up with him. My grand, my sister-in-law, she said, if you run across a Colonel Sloan, make yourself known to him because I babysat with his kids and she flew a lot with him. So <laughs> I, my sign shop was in a little building back here. Our headquarters building was up front. Clear across the field was the command office. And my commanding officer saw the field commander get in his, I think it was a World War I, a, a canvas top and stood about, it seemed like it was at least seven foot tall and it was big and he started out and our commanding officer saw him coming around the field so he thought he was coming over to visit us. He pulled right in and passed our, our commanding officer standing on this uh, like a little porch on the building. He was standing there waiting for him. He drove right past him and came back to the sign shop <laughs> and we shook hands and I knew who he was and he knew me from my sister-in-law. And we talked a little bit and then he left. And my commanding officer thought he was coming to see him and he never never stopped to see him at all. <laughs> so it was, he was right around the corner from where I was painting these girls on the officer's dining room. So I thought, well, why don't I go talk to him? So I went around, knocked on the door, he, invited me in and I told him what I wanted. I wanted more artwork and I'd like to get a transfer into some group that I could get more art. So he thought it over and he says, I think the only place would be in the regular army. So I said, well, whatever. I was willing. Well, I was still painting these girls on there and uh, I, I was painting for about a week or so all of a sudden, they said, here's some transfer papers for you. They were 10 days late. They had already been made out 10 days ahead of time. I never saw them. So I was transferred to this new outfit, and 
service group with the 441st Troop Carrier Group, C-47s. And so I went to them and they called me in. They said, you're 10 days late. Where have you been? Well, then it came to me, they were holding them up because I was painting these girls on the officer's dining room. <laughs> so they were holding out the transfer. So I explained to them. So as soon as I explained to them what I was doing, why they held me up, oh, you're an artist. Oh, we got all kinds of jobs for you. <laughs> so then the first one was that I remember, the officer's uh, bar. They had a bar there that they wanted three pinup girls painted around the thing. So, and the captain, he was our dentist, and he told the bartender, whatever he wants to drink, give it to him. So I was sitting on the floor, and every time I reached up, I'd take a drink. I didn't know what I was drinking. I wasn't a drinker, but I drank with the other guys. And after the third drink, you don't notice what it tastes like. So I went until noon painting, and I was squatting on the floor, sitting there painting these girls. And uh, my buddy, who was a professional wrestler and boxer in New York, Italian fellow, he came by and he says, you going to lunch? And I said, no, I'm going to keep on painting. He said, I think you ought to quit. He could see my condition, but I didn't feel a thing. And he says, you either quit or I'm going to pick you up and take you. Oh, I knew he could do it. I mean, he, anybody wanted any hard, heavy work to do, they always called John. John D'Onofrio is his name. So I thought, well, he can, he can pick me up and take me, so I better just quit. So I cleaned my brush and I got up and man, it hit me. As soon as I got up. I didn't go to lunch. I went back to my tent and fell in a bunk and slept. I was working on this book and they set me up in the headquarters building with a little room. I had a bed, I slept there. My service group couldn't touch me because the headquarters of the 441st had requested I do this artwork. So I was doing this artwork and uh, they, uh, there were several interesting stories. I got up one morning and no sound of airplanes were outside. There was no windows in my little room. I went outside to look around. There was no airplanes on the field. They had all gone. There wasn't a vehicle moving. There wasn't anybody walking, any, nobody on the field. Absolutely nobody. And I was there all by myself. And I thought, where in the heck did everybody go? They didn't tell me they were going. I didn't know where they went. So I thought, well, I'll go back. They'll be coming back. So I went back in and kept on working. And they didn't come back. But a, a plane came in, a Spitfire. It landed. I don't know what he did or what he came for. But he, a little while later, he took off. So I went out to watch him take off. And standard procedure was if they came to our field or any field to eat or something, they'd give them a little show for thanks. So he took off and there was nobody on the field except me. Probably some guys in the control tower and probably one or two in the mess hall. So I stand there watching him and he circles around and he sees me and he comes diving right at me. And a Spitfire, a very maneuverable plane, it'd come down and back up. And he circled around and he did it again, coming right at me. And I thought, what's he going to do? <laughs> coming right at me like that. It really made the hair stand up on your neck. I thought, what the Sam is he doing? Well, he was giving me the show. Oh, that's nice. Then he left. So, gosh, was my outfit, nobody came back. The MPs at the gate were gone. There wasn't a soul. So I thought, well, gee. They're all gone. Why don't I just go into London and visit my aunt and uncle who lived in London and my cousin. So I took my briefcase, this briefcase right here. It's an Air Force briefcase that I confiscated. And I had that with me and 
I went into town, got on the train, and who gets on the train but an MP? And I thought, oh boy, that's all I need is an MP. And he saw me, so he came over and sat with me. I was the only GI on the train. So he starts telling me the story. Something big was going on. And all of England was restricted to military personnel. They're not supposed to be off the base. Oh boy, I'm off my base. <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to get around. I didn't explain it to him, but I think he understood. I think he knew what was going on. And he, we went into London, and he says, your exit is right over there. He knew where I was going. I was going out to my aunt and uncle's in Greenford. And he says, I got to make my report. I got to go out this exit. So he left, and I, he says, see those two MPs over there standing at the entrance? They'll want to see your pass. I said, oh, geez, I don't have a pass. So I walked slowly, trying to think, what am I going to tell these guys? Pretty soon this MP comes running up. He said, I'll make my report tomorrow. He said, I got to go out your way. So we walked right through the two MPs. Here I am with an MP walking with me. These two MPs never even bothered me. So I went through and got on the, uh, well, they didn't call it the subway, underground. And uh, got on the underground, going out to my aunt and uncles and the MP with me. And he says, you know those people looking at you? I said, no. He says, they think you're carrying important papers in your briefcase and you've got an MP guard. <laughs> so <laughs> he got off at his stop and I went out to my aunt and uncles and I said, I'm not going out of the house. We're going to listen to the radio, and when something big takes place, I'm getting back to my base. <laughs> so the radio announced what happened. It was the Battle of the Bulge. And as soon as they announced it on the radio that this took place, well, I knew where my outfit went. They were flying supplies into the guys in the Battle of the Bulge. So I got back to my base before my outfit did. So I was safe there. But I did more, I did officer's bars, leather jackets. I did a lot of them for the pilots. and They wanted to pay me 10 bucks and 10 bucks for nose art on a plane. And I never charged for them, I wanted to fly. So I'd say, when you're going up, let me know. I'd like to just fly with you. So I did fly with two B-17s in one day, both of them crash landings. <laughs> in the morning I saw this B-17 I was in charge of the dope and fabric shop and paint shop. So I had five fellows working for me. And so I told the guys, if anybody's looking for me, tell them I'm out at the bomb dump painting signs out there. Well, nobody would come out the bomb dump looking for me, which I did go out there quite often. So I say, so let's see this B-17 warming up. And I thought, I'll go out and see if I can get a ride with him. So I'd get the pilot's attention and I'd say, like that to him, he'd shake his head up, but now you point down at the ground master uh, sergeant, and I had to sign his sheet in case the plane crashed. It had to be tested before it went on a flight. So they were testing it to see if it was airworthy. So I got in the plane and I had to sign the sheet, so if it crashed, they knew who went down with it. And I signed it and got in the plane, and the whole crew was on the plane. and. Uh, when we come in for a landing, oh, the pilot wanted everybody up in the radio room. Have you ever been in the radio room of the, a B-17? There isn't much room. So I sat on the floor and the rest of the guys were standing. The radio man was sitting in his seat. I mean, it was crowded. When we landed, we hit the ground so hard, the radio tube, there are tubes in the radio then, the tubes are bouncing out and falling on the floor. and the crew chief, he says, what the hell's he doing? Oh, the plane had bounced high enough, the guys on the ground said, it bounced high enough, a truck could have driven under us. We hit and bounced clear up. So I, that was in the morning. In the afternoon, I see another B-17 warming up. So I went out, motioned to him, and I got on the plane. Nobody's on the plane except the pilot and the uh, co-pilot, and he had three, ground officers in the nose 
they wanted to go for a ride too. So we take off and <laughs> uh, it was Captain Reardon. He had a reputation and he used to get grounded an awful lot because of things that he did. And he came back and there's a hedge in the runway and he headed right for the hedge. He was going to scare these guys in the nose. And so I figured while we're coming in for a landing, I'll go up in the radio room. And uh, so I went up in the radio room, sitting in the radio man's seat, and all I could see is out the window here, see the wing. That's all I could see. And I hear a loud crash. And I thought the tail end of the plane was gone. And I looked out the door, it was still there. But he had headed right into this hedge and he was going to raise it over there and drop it in a runway, runway and he didn't raise it up. He went right through the hedge and there were posts in there and fencing inside of the hedge. We were dragging posts and fencing down the runway with us and he stopped halfway down the runway and these three officers in the nose were cussing him out and I thought well this is no place for me so I walked back and <laughs> I didn't wait around to see what happened, but I knew what happened. He went through the hedge, but that was two in a, one day. I was doing this book, and we went to France. The whole outfit moved to France, and uh, they a roll call, and some guy comes running up. Hughes, he says, there's three planes out on the runway. You're supposed to be in one of them. I didn't know what was going on, but I they said, you're going back to Taunton. So I ran out and pounded on the plane and the guy pulled me in. And so we flew back to Taunton, it was all fogged in. We flew up to London, it was fogged in. Flew back to Taunton and he saw an opening in the fog and he went down through the fog. And uh, we were flying over the trees like that with a C-47. And uh, we got to Taunton all right. And I went into Taunton checked on the printer. He was printing the book all right. He hadn't, they thought maybe if we went to France, the printer might just lay it aside. Well, he was still working on it. So that's all I needed to do, find out if he was still working on it. So I went back to the airfield, the plane's gone. It went back to France without me. And I didn't have a pass. They didn't have time to even issue a pass. So I am in England and in the dark, I had taken a girl from the Red Cross. I stayed at the Red Cross. I went there, to, and they said, well, we can set you up on a, a bunk out in a warehouse. So that's where I stayed. And uh, I took this girl to her first Bing Crosby movie. And coming out of there in the blackout, I have no idea how the MP saw me, but in this blackout, they pulled up along the curb. Soldier, can we see your pass? How did they know? I have no idea. In a blackout. And I said, I don't have a pass. Get in the Jeep. So I told the girl, I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. And so I got in the Jeep, went to the MP headquarters and talked to the captain. And he said, well, you look honest. He says, your story sounds good. But he said, you better be out of town when your plane gets back. Well, a whole week before they came back, they didn't miss me. My outfit didn't even miss me because they thought I was with the troop carrier group. Troop carrier group thought I came back with the plane and I was back with my service group. So nobody was looking for me. Well, eventually they missed me. <laughs> so they flew back to England to get me. I had special services. <laughs> but uh, then after that, that book had to go to troop, the troop carrier command. I'm sure it went to them. And Troop Carrier Command said, that's the guy we want in Paris. And I'll tell you my theory on that, why you'd ever heard of it. I got a theory on it that I think happened. So I was, I got the pass, the orders for me to go to Paris. You'll get the copies of that. And uh, so I went to Paris. I didn't know what was going on. I was supposed to be there seven days. I never saw the orders, they just sent me and, and five other guys, they had to set the display up and after they were through, they all left, went back to their 
outfits. And I was there all by myself. And I could have gone a block away to the MP headquarters and slept there, but I didn't know any of those guys. But I had to go there to shave and uh, shower and stuff. And uh, it was only a block from the tower. So I thought, Jesus, the plane's made up as a hospital ship with three decks of cots all the way up through the plane. So I'll sleep in the cot clear up by the uh, pilot's uh, section. Then the French people look in and see a dummy on a cot all bandaged up and tubes running to it. And the French couldn't see me up there. So I decided I'd sleep in the C-47. So that's what I did. And I, it was it wound up that I hadn't heard that I was only supposed to be there seven days. I hadn't seen the paperwork. I just went, and I figured, well, when they're ready, they'll, they'll take me back. Well, it never happened. It went on and on and on, and not, I never heard any word about when I was supposed to go back, so I was there for three months. And uh, when I got the paperwork, after I got discharged, or when I got discharged, and looked at the papers, I was supposed to be the only seven days. <laughs> so while I was sleeping in this, in uh, something you probably didn't know, the Eiffel Tower belonged to the United States at that time. Yeah, it was our tower. And the Frenchman in charge of the tower told me all this. He told me that Hitler came there and wanted to go up in the tower, and they told him the elevator wasn't working, which was a lie. But he, I'm not going to walk up there. So I got a picture of him, not one that I took, but somebody took, the, some of the Germans took it, of him and his whole troop walking away from the tower. But we, we had to walk up the steps to get up there. The second landing was an, a bar, open till 2 o'clock in the morning, strictly for Americans. Nobody else could use it. It was Americans. It was our tower. And we had a radio station clear up on the top. And I never got up there, but uh, I would have had to climb all the way up. But uh, this bar was open till 2 o'clock only for American GIs. And the guys would walk the stairs going up there, and they'd stay until 2 o'clock, buy a bottle of whiskey, and walk around the perimeter of the tower on the second landing drinking the whiskey when they emptied over the side. And there were 15 airplanes down below. Uh, bombers, fighters, uh, uh, C-47, C-46, two gliders, the uh, CG-4A and the CG-13. And they were all sitting down below and they'd throw this bottle over the side and I'd be at two o'clock in the morning you're half asleep and it crashed down on your plane. It's a rude awakening. <laughs> so, one of the really funny stories about it, I'd go to bed and in the C-47 after dark, you could put your hand in front of your face and you couldn't see it. I really, I mean, it was that dark. And I felt the plane rock and I thought, who's messing around with the plane? I had to rock some more, and I, I just kept quiet, and that's when I said that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Uh, somebody was getting in the plane, and I thought, who in the heck is getting in the plane? They didn't have a light or flashlight on, so I couldn't see them, and they were coming up through the plane, and I was laying in my cot, my arm on the edge of the cot. It was an pre bringing a French girl in. <laughs> All those cots were handy. So she's coming, and the C-47 is such an angle, you have to take hold of something, you just can't walk in. And she was taking hold of the cots as she was walking in. And when she got to my cot, she got a hold of my arm, and she let out a blood-curdling scream I'll never forget. And the MP turned his flashlight on, and he says, I didn't know anybody was in here. I said, I live here. He said, I just wanted to take her up and show her how the instruments light up in the dark. <laughs> so I told him, go ahead. It took him all five minutes. I tell this when I speak to groups because they get a big kick out of it. It took him all five minutes to show her what instruments light up in the dark. 
And I said, I spoiled that guy's whole evening. <laughs> they, they left. But uh, the, we had it all, the whole Eiffel Tower was fenced in. We had this roll up fencing, they had that all the way around the tower. And the MPs were keep the French out at night. Guess what they had for fencing in the front? They had a B-17 sitting right in the middle, like a marquee on a theater. The people came in and went underneath the wings of the B-17. The fencing around here were 500 pound bombs, all standing on end. And nobody's going to go around those or move them. And they were about that high, 500 pound bombs, and all stacked against each other, all the way around to the sides and then the wire fencing. And uh, I got a picture of those bombs. <laughs> it looks like they dumped them. When they first delivered the bombs, I was there before it even opened, and they were still building the ex exhibit. And I've got a picture looking down from up in the tower. You can see all these bombs laying on the ground before they even set them up. And uh, I got pictures out of the back of the tower showing lumber just laying there waiting to be used to build something. They built one, a canvas hanger. Have you ever seen one? Oh, well, they had built a, a canvas hanger and they showed the first showing of Memphis Bell in there. And that was the, there's two Memphis Bells movies. One's the military version. The other one is the story, the Hollywood version. And I've got copies of both of those movies. And I went in and watched the Memphis Bell movie that was the French people could see it, Memphis Bell, and it was the strictly a military movie. And uh, so that's, that's how I got to Paris, and I didn't know I was only supposed to be there seven days. I got a letter here requesting I be sent back to my outfit. They needed me, I was so important, <laughs> painting pit of girls. <laughs> I was so important they wanted me back and in a military letter, you've probably seen them, they make a request here and down below the answer. Well, they said if they had somebody else with my qualifications to replace me, they'd be happy to send me back. Well, that was, it was dropped. I mean, they didn't have anybody. So I didn't know all this was taking place until they gave me these papers when I uh, got out of the service. So that's how, then a Jeep arrived after the show had closed and the Jeep was assigned to me, which I didn't know, with a driver and he came to pick me up and we drove two days up to get to Frankfurt where my outfit had gone. And uh, when I got to Frankfurt, I called the Colonel who had been in charge of me at the uh, tower I talked to him on the phone and I said, my number was coming up for coming back to the States. The war was over. And uh, I says, any chance that I could keep the Jeep and do a little sightseeing? He says, keep it. So I had it for a whole week and guys that had the day off would get in my Jeep and we'd go sightseeing around Germany. And it was a lot of fun. He finally, the colonel finally called me. He says, you're going to have to give up the Jeep. They're asking for it. <laughs> so this is a question about materials and techniques, because something valuable for our purposes here in the museum is how the nose art work was done. How did you get from a picture, how did you get it on the airplane? Did you chalk it out? Yeah. So uh, describe, uh, describe the process. How did you well, do it? Well, now... If I, like Doc, uh, I did a pattern at home on my wife's sewing room wall. I put paper up on the wall and then I drew Doc on there. Then I, you perforate that with the, I've got an electric perforator that puts little dots in, it burns little holes. And I did that whole pattern that way. And then I called, before that, before I did the pattern, I talked to people at Boeing and I said, measure from the windows down to where it curves under. I got to know how much room I got because mm -hmm. I'd never done a B-29 before. 
the guy didn't know what I was talking about. He says, I'm not sure I understand. So he gave it to somebody else. I talked to him. I said, measure from the windows down to where it starts curving under. That's all I want. The second guy didn't understand. My daughter took my wife and I to England on our 60th anniversary. And uh, the you probably never heard of Wayne Gomes. He's an aviation photojournalist, an internationally known photojournalist. He is a very close friend of mine. Calls me about every day. He's going to want to know what took place today. Yeah. And anyhow, he uh, he was with the B-29, and uh, he gave me three videotapes of their getting dock off the desert. And he said, you can pass these out to the museums over there. So I went to Duxford to the museum, and they said, you can't get into the, into the American section. It's under construction. I said, well, then you don't get my videotape. Uh, we'll call somebody else. So they called another guy, and he listened to me. He says, well, I can't get you in there because it's under construction. OK, you won't get the tape. Oh, well, I'll call somebody else. <laughs> they wanted that tape. So they called the courier. And he came in, and I told him, I said, I got a tape here for you, but I got to get in to measure that B-29. He says, I'll get you in. He says, all you have to do is wear one of these bright colored jackets and a helmet. I'll get you in. So we went in, and he got a ladder for me. I climbed up. There was 45 inches. It was that simple. I got back off the ladder. I, I mean, it took minutes. What was the technique you used to get from the picture to the airplane? I'd go up and draw it on the plane with chalk, like you said. It's the only way we had. I didn't have any way to make patterns or something. If I, if I did a lousy drawing, it was a lousy painting. And I, if it didn't look right, then I'd have to get back up and try to correct it. I didn't have much time. I had, say, from 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon until it got dark. And the plane may be there tomorrow, but it may be gone, which in a lot of cases happened. It, I didn't get completely finished. I didn't get the lettering on. And uh, so somebody back at their base tried to finish it or did what they could on it. So it was. Uh, it was, uh, at that time, it was a simple thing. You got up there on a ladder and you sketched it out. And if it looked halfway decent, you painted it because you had to do it in a hurry. And they can't wait. I mean, the plane's got to go on another raid tomorrow. <laughs> was it all brush work? Mm -hmm. All of it. Oh, yeah, we didn't use airbrush. We didn't even have airbrushes then. And uh, didn't even know what an airbrush was. And. Uh, we were able, the Air Force got sign paints, which was good. They got sign, regular sign paints. Um, otherwise, we'd have to go into town and see what we could find at some of the stores in town. And uh, they didn't have much, in, they did have sign paints, same as we have here. Uh, bolted colors is what it's called. And uh, it, uh, we had the paints. And we had brushes put up. Ever heard Grumbach air brushes? They're one of the best. But during the war, they were the worst. They were junk. They were getting full price. I mean, Grumbach was making out. Um, and uh, every brush had Air Force or Air Corps on it. And when I came home, I brought a bunch of them home with me. I use them if I don't care what happens to the brush because they're not good brushes. But I'll use them for roughing up stuff. And so I, uh, I've got a bunch of their brushes still in my collection at home with air core on it. <laughs> You've continued to work over the years. As oh, yeah. I, I'm so you're, tell me about you, that you're, you're still doing this for, how, how do people find you? Uh, I don't know. They, uh, they've heard of me. They've heard of me. That's how I got Doc because Wayne Gomes, the photojournalist, 
he had interviewed me for a British magazine. I was supposed to be, uh, I was supposed to do the artwork on uh, Glacier Girl. I have to stop and think which plane. Glacier Girl, you know what, Glacier Girl. I was given the job by Mr. Schaffner, who owned the plane. He's the one that spent three million bucks getting that plane out of the glacier. Bob Carden, the engineer uh, for Schaffner, he was working, I had full run of their hangar. And I'd go around and I'd take pictures. I got pictures from the very beginning on Glacier Girl up till the finished. And uh, Bob Carden, the engineer, was working up in the wheel well and the cable wasn't working right over a, a pulley. And I was looking up there with him and uh, I'd had machine shop training and he was telling me the problem he was having and I, I said, it looks like you need to stretch that open so it isn't so tight on the cable. Uh, so I just voiced my opinion and he left. So I was still wandering around taking pictures of the plane and he came back, he had a tool, hydraulic tool, and he says, you think this will do the job? <laughs> he didn't have to ask me, he was the engineer and he was the one that, but he came back to me, he says, you think this will do the job? And I said, that'll sure do it. It was a hydraulic thing that would spread whatever he was working on, that's what he needed. And <laughs> but he asked my opinion if it was all right. And so I did, I said, oh, that would do it. So he went ahead and did it. And, but he was courteous enough to give me the honor of coming to me, ask me if I thought it would be all right. <laughs> but uh, Bob told me that if Mr. Schaffner passed away the next day, I would be there the next day putting my nose art on it. You'll see the nose art that I proposed. And Mr. Schaffner, and all the mechanics, everybody approved my artwork. So Mr. Schaffner said, well, let's go up to the house, to his home, and see what my wife says. So uh, Virginia, my wife was always with me, Virginia, and we went up to Mr. Schaffner's house and we sat down, had tea with he and uh, his wife, Eddie Lou is her name, and uh, he said she had ideas, and she said it's perfect, don't touch it, leave it just the way it is. So I was happy. So I was planning on doing the nose art on it. And every year when we went down to my daughter's in Chattanooga, we'd stop by in Middlesbrough and see how Doc was, or how Glacier Girl was coming. And I'd take more pictures, and I'd go up on a balcony here and a balcony over here to take pictures from up above. And like I say, I had the run of the hangar. I could go any place I wanted. Everybody knew me. And uh, ten years went by, and I every year we'd stop, stop. We'd have a meeting with Mr. Schaffner, his wife, Bob Carden, and my wife and myself. And she would make changes. I'd like to see long hair on her, okay, and uh, more bosom showing, and more sexy. So the next year, I'd come back with a new sketch. I'd like to see high heels on her. I said, what's she doing with high heels on a glacier? And I'd like to high, high heels. Okay, so I went back. The next year, I had the girl with high heels. I did two sketches in full color, and after the second one, I started just giving her a pencil sketch. I wasn't going to go to all this effort of making a painting, and so I uh, did these pencil sketches for, for 10 years, making changes every year. After the 10th year, I said, that's enough. Either take what I've given you or get somebody else. Well, Mr. Schaffner had said the job was mine, but that didn't mean anything. I got a letter, I got a card, I should say. My wife and I got the card inviting us down for when uh, 
Glacier Girl would make its first flight. Uh, Wayne Gomes, the photojournalist, he was invited and he sent a message back and told him he wasn't interested if my artwork wasn't on the plane. And I said the same thing. If the plane didn't have my artwork, I'm not interested in the thing. So we didn't go and uh, Mr. Schaffner was ailing and it was shortly after that, that the plane flew that he passed away and Bob Carden had told me if he died, I would be down there the next day painting that original girl, the original sketch on the plane. Well, that didn't happen. Eddie Lou, his wife, inherited the whole thing and she sold the plane to a Texas oil man so they've got Glacier Girl on it in the lettering that I used on my sketch, but it's just got the lettering. It doesn't have the girl on it. So it's, it's been an interesting life. And doing artwork, I was exempt from a lot of stuff that uh, the guys had to do. That I, Normally, I would, if I didn't have a job that I was doing some artwork, I did it along with them like emptying coal cars. They were actually coke over in England, coke cars. And uh, we emptied one car and go to the next car and empty that one. That's what we used for heat. And we got German prisoners. I was assigned five German prisoners and it was like, it was kind of odd. I always felt it was odd. Yesterday, if we had met those guys on the field, it was either you kill me or I kill you. Today, we're buddies, we're old friends. I had, them, I had to keep them busy. Went out and there was a woods across from our paint shop and I sent them out there to cut trees for firewood and because uh, we didn't have anything else at that time. And uh, after we'd cut the whole woods down, <laughs> Really, I mean, we couldn't see the airplanes that were taking off on the other side of the woods. By spring, you could see the airplanes. Because <laughs> there was all these shops, parachute shop, and a, a propeller shop, and my sign shop, and different shops along this line. Everybody was sending guys out to cut the trees down for firewood. And the French uh, sued the Americans $1,000 per tree. <laughs> So it, uh, it was just one of the things that we did. And the, uh, when I had, uh, the Germans, when we got finished having them cut trees down, well then I'd have them come in and rake up the shop. And then I didn't have any more jobs, so I'd tell them to sit down. Couldn't talk to them and uh, couldn't talk their language. And I had two Italian guys, but they didn't speak German. So I'd have them sit down and we'd try to talk to them and then we'd sit there and laugh at each other because we weren't making any sense. And they'd laugh at us and we'd laugh at them. It was, it was interesting. <laughs>